Our next speaker uh, probably needs no introduction, uh, so I'll keep it short. I'm going to try to keep most of the introduction short. You have a very thick program with lots of information on all of our speakers. Uh, Blair is a fellow at the uh, Brookings Institute in uh, Metropolitan Public Policy, was a fellow at the Aspen Institute. He wrote the plan that we're all working on now, the National Broadband Plan. Uh, he started gig.u. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Blair Levin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, for, for organizing this. It's a real honor to, uh, to be able to kick off this first Gigabit City Summit. Are my slides, oh, I, 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 I'm in control here? Wow. <laughs> it's really unusual for me. Um, so the arc of history is long, but every now and then it curves, steepens, and you can actually see the moment, uh, not just the gradual sweep of change. And I think we're at such a moment. It entails the creation of a new commons, an information-rich commons that will define a generation of cities. You know, in the last 40 years, I think our country has often overlooked the value of the commons. But if there's any audience that should understand the importance, it's cities, because they've built their foundation and created value not by investment in personal goods, but by investing in what we all share, as we were just talking about the roads that we can all use. A uh, recent example, which, which way am I pointing? Oh, so I'm going, there we are. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Uh, high technology, such a wonderful thing. Uh, a recent example is the High Line in New York, which I, I hope all of you have, uh, if you've been to New York, have had an opportunity to walk along. It's already generated mo well more than $2 billion in private investment, doubling the value of adjacent properties. This demonstrates something that policy debates often ignore, but a real estate industry, uh, interestingly, never forgets. The internal mantra of their business is uh, location, location, location. Uh, what makes one location superior to another is not an individual building, not granite in the kitchen or marble in the entry, but the commons that that location shares, the commons that all create, that the cities create and that everybody in that area is allowed to use. So uh, what is the critical commons for the cities in our era? And we can look forward by looking backwards. A hundred years, years ago, you might have asked, what would be critical for a city as a foundation for economic and social progress in the decades ahead? Thank you. Uh, even then, you would have known about the importance of common infrastructure for water and electricity, if you'd been visionary, you might have foreseen and created space for an airport. Uh, actually, you would have been crazy to try to create a, a space for an airport 100 years ago. Um, you would have had been very visionary, uh, or a distribution center, or a technology-focused university. But now ask, how do we answer that question today? Because we know that economic value creation, which for several millennium um, has been uh, based on the manipulation and distribution of physical objects, increasingly will be based on manipulating, transporting, and analyzing bits of information, as the mayor just talked about, uh, getting the, the cameras on the cops. It is both gathering that information, transporting it, analyzing it. All of those things are important. And in that light, we know that the common assets cities will need will include affordable, abundant bandwidth, such that bandwidth never constrains innovation, economic growth, or social progress, ubiquitous devices that provide actionable intelligence everywhere and through all systems, and a digitally ready population uh, and city government. And through these, we actually create the information-rich commons. Now, this translates uh, to a number of different initiatives. Oops, sorry. Through these, uh, it translates to a number of different initiatives, including municipal Wi-Fi, open data, big data, digital training, and responsive government. You're going to hear more about the responsive government um, from Susan, who just wrote a book on it. Uh, it would be unseemly for her to advertise her own book, so I have to do it for her. <laughs> it is available on Amazon and in all fine bookstores everywhere. So I'm just going to focus on that abundant bandwidth um, uh, portion of this, uh, because for all of this to work, all cities are going to have uh, next generation gigabit, gigabit capable networks. Now the experience with such networks to date enables me to predict something I would guess most people in this room would agree with, 
and yet, to be candid, most cities yet are not thinking about. And that is that in the near future, there will be two kinds of cities. Uh, there will be those whose market structure pits cable versus copper and those in which cable competes with fiber. Uh, it's relatively easy to predict based on early data that in terms of housing, those with the cable uh, fiber structure will go up and those with that will go down. Similarly, early data suggests that in terms of economic attractiveness, um, those with cable fiber will find it more easy to attract economic development projects and those with that will find it harder. We can even predict, based on preliminary data, um, that cities with a cable fiber structure will improve their economic output more than those without. So while this vision is becoming clearer, we still have what Aaron and I have talked about over the last few years, what we might think of as the early adopters dilemma. We can see, we can sense the new world, but how do we get there? Where is our map? Uh, so what I want to do with the remainder of my time is discuss the map that's been created in the last couple of years. But first, we should discuss a question that always arises, whether we actually need a map. That is, some might suggest that market forces will uh, simply provide everything we need. Uh, why do cities need to act? And then we'll talk about the maps produced by the city efforts today. I want to quickly go back to 2009. Um, when the national broadband plan was going on and we asked uh, Columbia to um, provide a report on all publicly announced broadband deployments for the years ahead. The data was deadly. Th that's a little over dramatic, I suppose, but I, I, I love crime novels. Um, but for the first time since the beginning of the commercial internet, there was no national carrier uh, with plans to deploy a better network than the current best available network. And indeed, the data suggested and subsequent experience confirmed that the current market forces would not drive deployment of world-leading wireline networks in the US. For 85% of the country, uh, cable had the fastest network and the cheapest upgrade path. So the future looked a lot like uh, cable versus copper competition that would be premised on allocating scarce bandwidth instead of building on technological advances to deploy abundant bandwidth. So we thought about the question of how do we move from scarcity to abundance. Now, this actually caused us to have a thought about um, something which does not seem relevant, but in our bizarre minds it was, which is the prisoner's dilemma as a way to understand the challenge. Now in that classic game, game theory, the prisoners are better off if they both don't talk, but that requires that they trust each other not to talk. Uh, the cop wants them to talk, uh, but to do so he must cause a defection. But if we think about it from the term of, uh, from the sense of, um, uh, instead of talking, talking about investing, the cable and the telco folks are both better off um, by not investing in next generations, but rather by harvesting in past investments. But if we want that information rich commons, if we want the information, um, uh, if we want to lead in the information economy, we have to cause it affection. And that's where we were a few years ago, a vision but no map. Now things are changing thanks to the actions of a number of cities. Um, over the last few years, we've seen, um, so, uh, we've seen uh, really three different kinds of uh, activities. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap, but fundamentally cities that, supply, that are attracting large uh, suppliers, particularly those driven by Google Fiber. We've seen cities that organize demand to um, att attract traditional and new entrants, such as the efforts we've been doing with Gig.U. And we've seen so smaller cities that often uh, smartly direct some subsidies to drive an upgrade. While all cities face different challenges to succeeding, they face a similar economic challenge, which is that the current math doesn't uh, work. That is, the new or incremental capital and operating expenses of a next generation network uh, is not greater than the risk-adjusted revenues, um, plus the benefits to the system, plus the risk of losses. The path forward is to change that math and causing, where possible, capex, opex, and risk to go down and revenues, benefits, and competition to go up. And starting with Kansas City, really, and Google, three strategies that all cities that have been doing this have started to use, using assets more effectively, regulatory flexibility and efficiency, and aggregating demand. 
And under each of these, there have been a series of tactics that the communities have used to drive these strategies. Google, not just in the cities where they're at, but they've done a really great job in spreading information about how to do this. In 2013, it sponsored a report, uh, an excellent report that's still quite relevant today on technical strategies. And in 2014, uh, they put out a checklist. Um, and in announcing the cities they were negotiating, they've They've also done a great job of bringing other cities uh, and uh, potential suppliers into what we like to think of um, as the game of gigs, which, yeah, there we are. Uh, of course, we're not really at the stage where the incumbents must upgrade or die. We just think it'd be really, really great if they all thought that was true. Uh, and I think that in a few communities, they're actually starting to believe it. Indeed, the map has changed dramatically in the last 12 months. Now, a year ago, we would have just been talking about Chattanooga, Lafayette, um, and Kansas City, and now we can talk about a lot more communities. The most significant thing about this chart, actually, is that in 100% of the communities where Google is negotiating to provide a gigabit service, the incumbent telco has announced plans to do the same and cable firms are also starting to do so. We should not kid ourselves. Press releases are not the same as fiber deployments, but there's a lot of evidence that affection is starting to happen, particularly in Google-targeted communities. But what if your community is not on Google's list? It doesn't fit its algorithm. Uh, there are options, and let me walk you through what some gig.communities have been up to. We now have about 70 communities involved with various projects stimulated are that include gig.u communities. They've involved all kinds of different networks and sizes, including uh, small little zones, uh, larger districts, um, moving up to entire cities and neighborhoods. Um, the regions, um, uh, Elise Cohn is here, uh, who works with the North Carolina Next Generation Network that involved uh, six cities and uh, the four universities around there uh, and did a terrific job. Um, Elise is actually, I think, the only person who's negotiated with both Google and AT&T and a number of others, uh, and things are really starting to happen there, which was entirely a result of the way those communities organized. Uh, and in the most recent one, uh, it really involves the entire state. The state of Connecticut, we got three um, cities to kind of provide the anchor and then uh, 43 other cities joined, uh, put out an RFP, and today, actually, because we wanted to plan it in line with Aaron's um, planning, uh, the, um, a number of companies will be filing their responses to those requests. Um, I don't exactly know what will happen, but based on the discussions to date, it will be really interesting. Some very creative things are, are coming in. Now, this is not to say that um, all of our efforts have worked extremely well. Indeed, some stalled out, some didn't work. Um, but, um, and we've written some reports on the lessons learned, both by the successes and the failures. I'm not going to review those here, but we are working on a composite um, uh, handbook that we'll be putting out in the next few months. I do think it's important. Uh, there's one question I want to make sure that every mayor asks themselves and asks their staff, which is, is the network that you have today good enough for 10 years from now? And I want to offer three insights into answering that question uh, and what to do if the answer, as it, by the way, has always been, is no. And those are three things to keep in mind. Number one, that everything that happens in your city 10 years from now will be enhanced or degraded depending on the quality of the networks. And both mayors, I think, spoke quite eloquently to that. Secondly, and this is too often ignored, many things you're doing today or will do in the next few years will affect the quality uh, of the networks that you have. Um, all kinds of rules that you adopt today when, you do, when you're doing housing, when you're digging up streets, your ability to take advantage of those things uh, affects the networks that you have. And finally, the broadband is really bought as a community. While individuals think they have a choice, the choice is really predetermined by the choices the community makes. Let me illustrate this by saying that a few years ago we had a meeting, gig.u meeting, that was a representative of a large cable company that said it could sell our communities a gig today. And it would just be for $7,000 a month uh, with a $7,000 startup fee and a two-year pre-commit. 
Uh, it is now facing competition that will sell the same product at $70 a month. And what do you know? They want to sell a similar product at a similar price point. The difference was not that some brilliant engineer came up with a new way of delivering the service for them. It was not that some technology came in that lowered the cost. Rather, the difference lay in how the community itself approached how they bought bandwidth by improving the math for the deployment of next generation networks. Now, gig.u is not the only effort. We're thrilled that Next Century Cities, I know Deb Soch is here. I haven't seen her, but I know she's here somewhere. There she is. Um, is organizing not just university communities, which was our focus, but now has over 50 communities in a self-help effort to help each other build that information-rich commons. We love reading about other creative projects like what New York is doing with payphones to bring both abundant bandwidth and content, very, very information-rich content um, uh, in a very creative way. And we're very excited that the president uh, is scheduled to speak on the subject of broadband tomorrow. While we believe cities have and will continue to lead in stimulating next generation networks, uh, we certainly welcome federal initiatives to improve the economics of affordable, abundant bandwidth. So when it comes to the map, we are no longer in 1491. I think we're about in um, 1620. That is, the difficult but necessary age of exploration is thankfully behind us. I was, as was true in that era in history, there were some false starts, some efforts to discover a Northwestern passage that didn't exist. You know, for example, I, when I started Gig.U, I really actually wanted to do a national uh, RFP among um, about the 36 communities we had. But state law simply made it uh, impossible. And so we did what the explorers did. We, we just kept sailing until we could find a better port. Uh, but I think that we have reached our equivalent of Plymouth. Um, and the mayor was talking about how he could preach about um, uh, various things. Well, certainly the preachers in those days talked about Plymouth being uh, an errand into the wilderness to build a shining new city on the hill. And that's what I think we have an opportunity to do hill, uh, here. It will not replace, but rather will reinvigorate the great commons that the cities have created in the past, the transportation hubs, the marketplaces, the cultural centers, the recreation areas, and more. It will create that information-rich commons that will inure to the benefit of generations to come. But the first and necessary step is to make sure the city has a market structure that produces affordable, abundant bandwidth on which to build that commons. We may not know the precise uses of that um, bandwidth, but as a recent Pew study showed, we can have confidence that it will be the foundation of many ways to improve education, healthcare, public safety, and drive economic growth. There are many paths to the summit, but the journey be needs to begin now because it will take time, and we already know the relative direction of those who have scarce bandwidth versus those with affordable, abundant bandwidth, and we want to be on the right side of the arc of history. Thank you very much. I think we have to talk about the long-term impact of everything that we do, and this is one tool. You have to go forward with a plan and a vision, and you have to tell people up front that this is not something that we're talking about doing over the next three weeks. We're talking about doing this over the next 30 years, and that it is important for them to be engaged. One of the best ways, I think, to get that point across is to have them engaged in a real way. That's what we thought about when we put together the innovation team. That's what we talk about when we put together uh, boards and commissions, is that we get our citizens actually engaged in the conversation. Let them be the ones who carry the word forward that this is a long-term project, because they will always have more credibility, I think, than, um, than politicians to some extent. And, and one of the nice things about working with Mark and, and previously with Joe Reardon was is that I saw them not necessarily as mayors, but as leaders. Uh, leadership is important because leadership lacks the ego that politicians have sometimes. Um, and that leadership brought to bear means that you are going to do things that are directed towards building that city for the next 30 years, as opposed to doing things that are going to help you get elected at the next time a vote is cast. So that's basically how I look at it. And I know I got a little off point, but my mind is fuzzy this morning. And Mayor James could speak to this. 
as well in terms of the makeup of our communities. Because when we go and tout economic development, we tend to tout the shiny new things and not the struggling areas of our community. But um, I intend to be, and I know Mayor James feels passionately about this as well, the mayor of our whole city and not part of the city. And uh, I can assure you every house in Kansas City, Kansas, and every house in Kansas City, Missouri, has electricity, it has water, and it has a phone line. Because the utility companies hooked up every single home. Not some homes, not most homes, not a lot of homes, every home. There are homes in both of our communities that don't have cable because it was not beneficial to the cable company to run it because it was run as a minimum making exercise, not as a service to the community. That's a fundamental difference. And one of the things that's different, and as I mentioned, the, um, the fiberhood game of Google, one thing I will say about that is when we were able to turn every neighborhood green, Google committed to going to every sector of our community. That is different, and when the incumbents have come to me, and I have had some conversations, I won't speak much about them, my attorneys have asked me to not talk about it. One incumbent said, we're gonna do fiber to the, to the home as well. And one said, things that my attorney don't want to, doesn't want me to share with you. So I think that, <laughs> I think addressing the issue of, and this is the question I ask of everyone, are you coming everywhere? Or are you only coming to the wealthiest part of my community to make the maximum profit? Is this, businesses should be driven by profit. I don't begrudge companies for making money at all. I do want to see, I'm much more interested in community partners than I am in um, robber barons. We have plenty of robber barons in every company and I can just tell you um, there's a lot of liquor stores that are robber barons, there's a lot of payday loans that are robber barons. Um, the dollar everybody stores that pop up on every corner. These are folks who are driven exclusively by profit and not also by community service. And if we don't balance that, and if the government doesn't encourage them to balance it, nobody will. And I think that's part of our responsibility is to make sure there is a balance that we're actually coming in for a broader good, not just so another company can make money and close up shop and go to the next town. Um, that's a major, that's a major issue. I, I want to give you a chance to uh, follow up on that a little bit in terms of, because the, the way Google has built out with the fiber hoods, right. instead of the, that commitment to build in 100%, has raised some controversy. You've addressed it. Do you, wanna ha do you have any other comments on it? Um, yeah, and, and I agree with, with Mark that that is always the preference, but here is uh, uh, a byproduct of that. The fact that Google came in with a new product, spurred the others into expanding their reach. Um, we have 15 school districts in this city. And the, it's difficult to talk about individual schools or individual districts. What we talk about are more quality seats. And I don't care if the quality seats are in charter schools, parochial schools, private, public, wherever, as long as there are quality seats. What Google has brought to the table is enough competition to ensure that there are quality connections in places where there weren't. Those other companies who had previously been so directed on profit now find that it is in, to their advantage to go after some of the areas that Google has not gotten to because there is money to be made there. Um, at the end of the day, and I agree wholeheartedly with Mark, I know that he and I have a short list of those corporate citizens that we rely on for a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, if you can show these providers that there is profit to be made, that they will do it. They're not engaged in social reform or, 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 or doing those things uh, to the extent that we would like them to be. They're engaged in making money. We need to be able to show them how they can make money by doing the right thing. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, no, we're, do we have time for one more question? One more. Um, uh, and I'd like to follow up on something you guys both talked about. And uh, you, you, you basically run an enterprise. Now, most private sector enterprises are moving entirely to the digital platform. Right. They're assuming that they don't take jo paper job um, applications. But you, as a government, have to serve everybody, so you have to serve those who are on and those who are off. Exactly. Just for a minute, talk about 
how much easier it would be to run government if you could assume that 100% were on. In other words, what is the motive from the government selfish perspective as an enterprise to get everybody on and get everybody digitally literate? Oh, wow. Um, I, I think one of the motives is that it allows us to expand our database in ways that we aren't. Uh, it allows us to keep our costs down. We don't have to put inserts in the water bills. Uh, we, uh, uh, we would then be able to uh, enhance those digital tools that we have. We have a meeting monthly, KC Stat, which is a measurement, uh, which is a public discussion about our performance management indicators and where we are on a monthly basis. And our last one was with our communications department, and they broke down for us how people get their information. And it was really very startling. Um, that's still one of the most popular ways of getting information is in written paper form that people, everybody looks at their water bill. And so we found it very profitable from a communication standpoint to attach information that we want to get there. Um, I think that the one thing that we always have to do in terms of making sure that we're spreading it is to show people how it benefits their lives. Um, for us to talk about how it benefits government is good from our perspective, but that's not going to drive them or motivate them to do that. Uh, they have to see a clear connection to how it impacts their lives in a positive way. And then if they are able to afford the process, then they can get there. So we want to make sure that we're putting that information in places where people who may not be able to bring it into their homes still have access to it. Uh, church basements, libraries, uh, community centers, those types of things. Well, and I think the one of the things we've been working on at the Unified Government is just catching up to the groups that already have it and we're the bottleneck. So um, digital plan review for planning and zoning. Um, that's pretty common across the country. And we have just moved last year, uh, third quarter last year, moved to all digital review. Uh, the challenge we had was we had all digital, we had it earlier, but the Board of Public Utilities still didn't have it. And so the companies still had to print out a set to give to one group. Now we have full digital review of all plans that come into the unified government. So if you're doing planning and zoning, that's good for business. Business has been doing this for a while. So we've had to catch up to where the business world is so that we can have the same level of tech. And I guess that's the great challenge we face in, in municipal government is on one hand, we have to interface with the um, corporate world, which is very tech savvy, high expectations of tech usage, and then we also have to interact with the very low tech uh, population that either doesn't have it, doesn't want to have it, or even though we offer an opportunity to register your car for free through the mail. I just want to say anyone from Kansas City, Kansas, you can register for free through the mail. Um, people prefer to come in and stand in line and be grumpy. And, and I don't know why. Uh, but just offering New, I mean, mailing, I'm, I'm talking, I'm not talking high tech, I'm talking mailing it. Um, doing it on the internet would be a whole nother step. Everything, if we have to be tech savvy to deal with the corporate world and we have to, and we have to catch up to that and we have to help our citizens catch up because we can't even send an email to 25% of our population. And so we have the, we're kind of caught in the middle. Um, so we're catching up ourselves and bringing people along to the benefit, because wouldn't it be great to get the population connected to the corporate world? And that's really the bridge. And we serve as that bridge in a lot of ways. Well, thank you very much. And let me just close by saying that while I know, you know millions of people will hear what the president says tomorrow about broadband, um, uh, thousands of mayors are going to be watching what you do with this gigabit network. And I think in the grand sweep of history, that may prove far more important, because it is the actions of cities like the two Kansas cities that really will uh, prove important at this critical moment. So join me in thanking the mayors for what they've done.